Welcome to Season 3 of the Art of Teaching Podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you've joined me today. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you that have subscribed, listened and reviewed the episode. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Doug Thomas is a primary school principal who leads an independent school in Sydney. He's a visionary leader, a passionate educator and is driven by innovative school design, change management and the desire to create a culture in which people thrive. He is passionate about social justice, education for kids in poverty and making the world a happier and better place. I hope that you enjoy this wide ranging discussion with the one and only Doug Thomas. Doug Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Where are you calling from? Well, I'm from my office here in Coogee. Well, office at home because we're in lockdown at the moment. So can't yeah. go up to work. Well, there are there are worse places in the world to be uh, confined to your suburb and Coogee is a beautiful part of the world. Yeah, well, I'd love to say that I was looking out at an expansive ocean view, but no, we're not blessed to be down on the waterfront. But yeah, my, my front garden is looking pretty nice. Fantastic. Well, um, Doug, probably the most important question uh, of the interview, what, what's your coffee order for when I can finally buy you lunch and a, and a coffee? Uh, yeah, well, I, I never have just one coffee, so it's at least <laughs> two, sometimes bordering on three double shot long blacks or within the first hour of waking up. Wow, that's, not really mucking, that's, that's serious business. That's not mucking around. Yeah, then, it's, then, then there's no more coffee for the rest of the day. It's all herbal tea. I, uh, I noticed before we hit record um, that you were drinking a herbal tea. What, uh, what are you drinking? Uh, it's a bit of a strange one. It's a Twining's Black Currant and Blueberry. Fantastic. Well, I'm having a, uh, I'm having a coffee. So, uh, <laughs> um, Doug, what is, uh, what's an item that's still on your bucket list? Uh, yeah. I find that a really hard question to answer because I've got so many things that I would love to love to do. But I I think there's one thing that I've always dreamed of doing, and that's going up to the fjords in Norway. Fantastic. Doing a bit of bushwalking and also sitting in one of those beautiful cabins with a fire and looking at the view. That sounds wonderful. I uh, I am um, definitely thinking about travel at the moment. It would be lovely to be able to get back on a plane and go and explore the world, but uh, hopefully at some point not too far away. Maybe that should be our bucket list, just to get back on a plane. Just to get on a plane. Be grateful for wherever, wherever we're going. Exactly. Not necessarily to go anywhere, just to sit on a plane would be lovely at the moment. Did you hear about in Singapore they did that? They had a uh, dining experience on grounded planes where you could book in for a couple of hundred dollars and have a first-class meal, and then two hours later you'd get off the plane. Doesn't sound like a bad idea. <laughs> I think it's quite funny. Yeah. Um, Doug, um, when you uh, explain to people what do you do, how do you, uh, how do you go about that, that answering that question? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because uh, my, my life and my world is so uh, varied and diverse. But I would say, you know, number one, I'm a school principal. I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm an educator and incredibly passionate about that. Yeah. I still work in a... A great school community and yep. uh, very thankful for that. And uh, how long have you been a uh, principal for? Uh, going on to 13, 14 years now. So, yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Gosh, you see. Uh, sorry. I was, I was told that once you get to about 13 or 14 years, that's really when everyone's wanting you to, uh, to move on. Uh, so I'm working really hard to, to make sure that my use by date is still in the future. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, Doug, uh, just take us back to the beginning. What was your um, upbringing like and what, uh, what are you most grateful for from your parents? Uh, my upbringing was probably challenging to say, uh, actually. Um, I grew up out in the burbs of Sydney. Uh, it was a fairly working class area. Sorry about the dinging there. I hope that's okay. That's um, okay. We're, we're only um, we're just recording audio as well, so I can edit that bit out. So uh, don't stress. Uh, yeah. So I grew up in the burbs of Sydney, working class. Um, I had a fairly 
challenging childhood and also as a teenager. Um, my, my dad uh, had a problem with his alcohol and so family life was pretty tumultuous in terms of, you know, just dealing with that and dealing with the, the highs and lows of, oh, I don't know, just sometimes violence, sometimes anger. Um, so, yeah, so, and then the teenage years, I, I didn't really enjoy high school, um, but funny, I love school as a place of learning. I've always loved school. And so school was sort of like that, I don't know, bittersweet sort of place that I, I love to be at, but it was also a place of some difficult experiences, particularly in my teenage years. Gosh, do you think that has, um, that has shaped the way that you approach uh, your job as a principal? Uh, do, do, you think about, um, do you think about that a lot? Uh, yeah, I do, actually. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Um, yeah, I, I, it's funny how when you look back and you see how things have sort of panned out without even realising perhaps the steps that you were taking and the paths you were walking along. Yeah. Um, so for me, I, I often say to the kids at school now that my number one job is to keep them safe. Wow. And I suppose that comes directly back to the fact that I had moments, particularly in my primary school, where I love my teacher and a particular few teachers. So I had such a, a safe and cared and valued experience from them that that was really significant. Uh, yeah. particularly when family life was challenging at the time. Yeah. But I equally had times when school wasn't a safe place. So wow. I realised the importance of school being a place to thrive and, and a haven, um, yeah. particularly for kids who are going through, you know, whose lives aren't easy. Yeah. And was there a particular teacher um, that, and you mentioned a couple of, there were a couple of teachers, was there one in particular that, um, that really had a positive impact on your life? Uh, yeah, well, often talk about my my grade three teacher, Mrs. Macmillan, who uh, I, I have had a couple of chats to her over the years. Um, I just loved I just loved everything about her and, and the memories I have of being in year three uh, are incredibly positive um, to the point that uh, I used to have a little notebook uh, that I put on my desk and I used to write down all the things I loved about my lessons and my classroom experience with Mrs Macmillan because oh, it was then in year three I was determined to actually become a primary school teacher and that was my little book of notes for the things I was going to do when I became a, um, a teacher. Wow. Then moving into year six it was uh, kind of funny but uh, my grade six teacher was Mr Macmillan. It was, uh, they were married and so he was like a legend in my eyes and I equally yeah. had a a, a really positive year six experience. So yeah. I'm, I'm curious, do you still have that book? Uh, I wish. Yeah, I that's, don't. That, that, that's really wonderful. And it's so interesting, Doug, uh, to hear um, when I ask that question, uh, and I've had the privilege of asking that to many educators. Um, so many people talk about um, a teacher around grade three or grade four. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure what it is about those really sort of, I don't know if it's a coincidence or if it's something really formative about those years, because my year three teacher was a lady called Miss Jones. And I went through a pretty, um, a, a pretty traumatic um, a time. Of my, that was a pretty challenging time in my life. And I just remember um, every time I went into that classroom, to Miss Jones's classroom, I, I remember feeling valued and cared for and, and heard. And I know that she probably had 32 other students, um, but I felt like the only um, and the most important student in the whole world. And I, it's just curious or just interesting to hear um, uh, so many people talk about how these amazing teachers made them feel, not necessarily what we learnt with them. It's interesting, isn't it? I've, you often ask adults, you know, about a defining teacher they've had and it's, it's uh, either an incredibly positive experience or it's equally a very negative experience and people can be very articulate about that experience and the name of their teacher. Yeah. It's, it's scary how and powerful and also really wonderful, isn't it, if it's positive, yeah. that the name of that teacher and their influence is carried with you, you know, yeah. 
for the length of your life. Yeah. So, uh, Doug, would you say that you are a teacher first or a principal first? Oh, without a doubt, I would say I'm a, a teacher first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, most people, you know, if I was at a party or somewhere and they say, oh, what do you do? Um, I would say I'm a teacher. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. I, 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 um, I'd say exactly the same thing, um, regardless of how my role has changed and whatever leadership roles I've taken on within schools. I still can't shake the, uh, the response to that question. And I always say, look, I'm a teacher first. And I think for me, it's a really good way of reminding ourselves of what our core business is, and that's to make a difference um, in the lives of students. So, um, uh, Doug, in your role, you're obviously working as a principal, um, but how do you kind of balance those two things about prioritizing what is happening in the classroom, but also prioritizing leading a school? How do you sort of wear those, those I wouldn't say two hats, how do you wear those multiple hats as a school leader? Uh, I find it challenging and, and quite um, difficult because there's so much in me that wants to be gravita uh, gravitating to spend time in the classrooms with, yeah. with teachers and, and learners, and I, I don't do that as much as I really would love to. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like there's this magnet of paperwork and policy and compliance <laughs> and procedure that just yeah. keeps sucking me into my office um so i suppose what you know i talked about safety before you know in this past term uh, i've been on a committee looking at new child safe standards and revising child protection policies so i i kind of in my head just have to say okay there's there's great purpose there's uh there's a reason for this and if i if i nail it and get it right well, then ultimately that's going to impact the lives of, of kids and improve uh, you know, the quality of teachers and, and yeah. their practice. Yeah. So just to be clear about what I'm doing and why and how that translates to ultimately what I'm most passionate about. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, the role of an educational leader has changed over the course of your career? And, and, and what, what are some of your thoughts on where you see that going? Um, I wonder if, and this is a wonder question, if perhaps... It hasn't changed so much because good leaders 10, 20, 30, 100 years ago ultimately should have been doing the same things and perhaps were, but just in a very different context to us. Yeah. Um, where it's heading, I think, because this world is changing so rapidly and because of issues like our own mental health and our well-being and realising how important that is, I think what I'm seeing is that our decision making and the issues that we're dealing with, um, and I think this is a challenge of becoming such so high stakes. People have, um, you know, you you just can't afford to make mistakes. There's so much resting on it, and I find that both stressful and perhaps the challenge of leadership because, you know, I'm. On the, everyone says, oh, you're on school holidays, Doug. Well, there hasn't been a day yet in two weeks where I haven't spent most of the time, you know, doing work. And and that's because there are some important things that need to be done. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not being the martyr or the victim in all of this. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know about you, Doug, but I, um, I, I mean, I find it really challenging because for me teaching is... Uh, something which is so important and requires so much. Um, I find it really hard to to switch off and to um, uh, and and to work on that balance. Like, is there? Have do you think you've improved in that? In the in in uh, sorry, let me rephrase that question. Um, do you think you've got better at finding that balance, or is it just something that you um, continue to struggle with? Uh, it's a bit of both. I, I... I'm definitely getting better in that I realise how important it is and, you know, putting little things in place like prioritising my own, like, exercise, mm. prioritising, you know, time just to I wake up in the morning, uh, I spend time just reading, praying, contemplating, just getting a bit of perspective time so so keeping those sort of things as priorities uh, are really important um and i thought i was getting really good at it and then this thing called covid hit about 18 months ago and that seems to have just thrown everything <laughs> up in the air a bit so yeah recalibrate again yeah absolutely i think um 
uh, I was speaking to somebody yesterday uh, doing another interview and they said that, that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing pandemic, it has been the biggest thing to happen to education in a generation. And I think that um, it will be... Um, it will be a while before we see the, the true impact of that on teachers and students and school structures. And um, how do you think, um, speaking of the current pandemic, how do you think this has sort of changed the game for educators? I mean, what are some of the things that it's caused us to stop and consider or what are some of the questions that we've had to ask as a result of it? That's a huge question. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I think it is a huge question, isn't it? Um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, and then not in any particular order. I think it makes us question, and it's a good question, is what is what is real and deep and important learning? Yeah. So what are our priorities? Yeah. Um, so if we've got five days in the week and let's say on average four hours of really solid quality learning opportunities uh, a day, that's... You know, and obviously the school day is longer than that, but if we could bring it down to that, saying, okay, we've got these children's lives in our hands, yeah. what is it that they really need to learn and what experiences should they be having to really help them, one, just to navigate the day and the time that they're living in, but also to prepare them for the future and the world that they're growing up into? Yeah. Um, I think that's an important question. I think for me in my role as principal, what I've realised um, is the, the power of a teacher. And I think it was, no, I know it was fantastic to actually see um, parents in my school and to hear this feedback elsewhere, how, how people appreciate and respect uh, the practice of teaching and the role of teachers in their child's life and in their family lives. Yep. And I think the other thing that I was able to see was the power and the importance of a school in a community and when people are isolated and struggling and trying to make sense of the world and, and what was happening in front of them uh, and in lockdown, uh, the importance of connection and that school is a place of connection within the community and yeah. I think we've underestimated how important that is and how important that is going to be moving forward. Yeah. Absolutely. I, Doug, I couldn't um, agree more. And we work in two very um, different uh, school contexts, but I think the importance of uh, connection and community and the role of teachers has, um, for me, really been highlighted uh, during this ongoing pandemic. Um, do you think that, are you confident that we can learn um, from these uh, challenges and move forward? Or do you think, uh, or are you less optimistic? Uh, look, if I had to weigh it up, I'm I think, sadly, I'm less optimistic. Uh, I, I think what we saw in Australia, for example, was, okay, we all said, wow, this is like lockdown's helping us to realise what's important in life and I'm playing board games, I'm out at the park with my family and yeah. going back to basics in a way. And then the minute uh, we were kind of getting back into some sort of post-lockdown normal, whatever that was or is, everyone was just under the pump more than ever and and parents were saying look I've never been so busy I've never been kind of so stressed about the demands that have been placed on me and so I think well from a very big sort of philosophical level I think we need to look at what are the big picture basics that this world and this planet needs if we're going to actually be learning and prioritize those um, yeah. Yeah. It can't always be about economic growth, for example, yeah. um, you know, because that's just all about more, more, more. Um, I yeah. think we have to have some... I, it's like, I'd love to think that there are moments where we stop and we think, okay, what about equality? What about actually taking this thing called, uh, you know, global warming seriously? What about... Yeah, you know, people who are marginalised and vulnerable and saying, okay, how can we, uh, you know, invest and, you know, refocus resource and time and priorities into other people on this planet yeah. um, 
so yeah, I think maybe I'm being maybe I'm being too pessimistic about it um, because you know around the world I think it's really exciting to see certain movements where people are actually putting their foot down and saying enough is enough let's let's reprioritize some of the sort of big sort of systemic yeah. structures that are happening in this planet that we take for granted and yeah. let's let's look at things and do things differently. Absolutely. And, and Doug, um, in a couple of moments, we'll talk about some of the, incre- uh, the incredible work that you are uh, doing over in India and some of the work that you're doing in the not-for-profit. It is, uh, continuous, uh, continually inspires me. Um, uh, but I did just wanted to have a uh, sort of touch base about a change and why we talked a little bit about um, maybe your, uh, you're not being so confident that schools would um, be able to learn from this. I know that's uh, generalizing what you said a little bit, um, but what do you think change, especially in terms of school structures is really so difficult? Um, is, well, I mean, what's I going wrong there? Because you'd like to think that we would learn from these mistakes and these challenges. Well, I, I actually don't think it's the schools. I actually think it's the policy and it's more at a government level in terms of, you know, structures like the HSC, we, everyone, you know, you ask a, a, an educator what do they think of ATARs and, you know, university rankings and school rankings and things like that. And, you know, I'm yet to really meet an educator who says, wow, but they might say, oh, there's some value or benefit, which I would agree with. But at the end of the day, is that our priority or is that the most important thing we should be working towards? And nobody would say that's the case. So why do we still have governments that are dictating these sorts of structures? Um, yeah. yeah. I wonder if it's more of a reflection of this sort of assumed um, incompetence of schools and educators and this this idea that we probably need to overmanage. Um, I'm not sure that's just a thought that I haven't fully formed, uh, but it, it is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, you look at some schools, say, for example, the, like generally the, the New Zealand educators where there's less control and more space within the curriculum to mm. enable personalised learning and student, um, you know, lear, learner agency and, you know, there's more oxygen in the, in the, the learning space. There's more room to breathe in the school for students to, to take the lead and for teachers to be facilitators. Because yeah. I actually think if you give teachers more breathing space, uh, it's, it's one of the most prof- inspiring professions. Like the teachers, you know, I work with are amazing professionals. Um, yeah. But, you know, they have come through a university system that's trained them as educators to think about outcomes and achieving outcomes and it's pressure, 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 mm-hmm. evidence, evidence, evidence. And, um, yeah, I think that's really sad. Yeah. Uh, so, Doug, um, as your role as a principal, how do you begin to build that capacity into your, into your team? How do, you, um, how do you do that? Because change can be really messy and hard and sometimes... I would imagine as a leader, it would be easier to be able to control everything. Um, but how do you how do you build that capacity with your staff and your team? Uh, look, um, and I'm not going to say that, that I personally do this well, but I believe that it's it lies in a couple of things. One is ultimately empowering others. Mm. Um, I'm a great believer in that is the role of a leader. Uh, you know, if you're given some level of authority or responsibility or, you know, in a positive sense, you know, that sort of power, mm. um, your role is then to diffuse that power to, you know, enable others and to empower them. Yeah. Uh, at my school, and I can speak to our experiences and the successes we've had. Uh, we talk about our three core values, one being collaboration, one being innovation and the other compassion. And we just keep bringing back everything that we do to those three core values as our sort of foundation, as our driver. And I think collaboration is key there. So our work at Claremont is very much based around teams and collaboration. So we we actually, with a couple of exceptions, we will always have teams of teachers working together as opposed to one teacher in one classroom. Uh, there's always three or four teachers, so it's all about collaborative practice. 
Fantastic. And how do you um, make sure that people are moving in the right direction um, and that are on track? Or is that not a, uh, or is, is, is that not really the point? Uh, yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's incredibly important. I think it kind of goes with collaboration. Um, so rather than seeing it as a negative, uh, when collaboration is grounded in trust and respect, uh, mm. people realising that they're, they've got a shared purpose, a shared vision, and it's an equal playing field in terms of strengths and areas of expertise and equally awareness of the things that we, we don't do well as individuals, that, that then sort of creates a really healthy, organic sense of accountability. Yeah. So that's a positive. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's, um, that's so important. And I know the school that you are principal of has uh, received numerous awards for uh, learning space design and, and, and um, learning environments. Why is that so important? And, and why do you think that's such an essential part of, of learning? Uh, well, look, there's a fa famous uh, book that calls, uh, talks about the third teacher, and it's just talking about the learning space being the a, a teacher in a sense uh, and it's just about a space that enhances and facilitates good learning yeah uh, rather than the four walls and the desks uh essentially just uh being constraints and the teaching and the learning has to happen around the space the yeah. space should make great learning happen yeah that's really important and and finally um doug just in terms of your third sort of priority as a school compassion um uh, schools are incredibly complex and incredibly busy places. Um, how do you make sure that you still um, have that space and that time to connect with the individuals, whether it be our students or staff or parents? Um, how do you keep that as your core business? Um, you're talking about me personally or in my role? Or um, prob or? Probably in your role, um, but then also you personally. How yeah. do you make sure that you keep that central? Uh, I think I think what I'm learning is, and I and I used to really resent this, to be honest, was the feedback that people would say, uh, "You're not being, you're not visible," yeah. and you know, people would say, and you hear it all the time. Oh, uh, she or he uh, is is a great principal. They know everyone's names, or they're always at the school gate. And I used to think gosh, if only I had a job where I had enough time in the day to be able to stand at the front gate and meet and greet people. Um, and so I, I, I do prioritise those things because I understand how important it is, even just the chance encounters that you have with people to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, but I've actually learning uh, and trying to do this as a priority and, and it happened through the COVID lockdown as some people, you know, essential workers were coming in and out of the gate. That's where I was planted in the morning and in the afternoon because I think there's great power in those conversations and to be strategic in thinking, okay, that converse, this conversation is important um, and that it, I, I need to take it to more than just, hi, how are you? Good to see you move yeah. on. Yeah. But actually just hang around and make, uh, you know, that conversation, as I like to say, linger longer. Yeah. And kind of just prioritise that human connection. Yeah. Uh, that's really important. Yeah. I remember um, a number of years ago I was rushing across the playground and um, I think I had to get some photocopying done or I get a cup of coffee or something which I thought was incredibly important. Um, and this little girl stopped me and said, Mr. Green, look at my hair. And she just had mm -hmm. plaits done or something. And it was, and to be honest, I just sort of walked past her and, and, and sort of fobbed her off. And then I got about five metres down the playground. I turned around and looked at her and she was still looking at me. And I had this moment thinking, and obviously I went back to her and allowed her to if you like, interrupt me. Yeah. Um, but I had this moment and it really did change um, it, it really did change me. I had this moment and I thought this could be quite possibly the most important conversation or the most important thing I do today would be to acknowledge this little girl and actually talk to her and engage her. And I think um, for me, that's something that I've kept with me for years is we, it's not an interruption. Kids are not an interruption. People are not an interruption. That is why we are here as educators for oh, those connections. 100%. Fully and, agree. Yeah. And you know, like the photocopying or the, 
the the conversation I had to have in my mind was super important, but I was missing those little things with my with my students. And um, it's so lovely to hear you talk about that, um, about how you keep that as central. Um, I think it's really important. Well, it's easy to go, oh, these people are interrupting me from my work. And I think we have to rephrase that and say these people are my work. Yes, uh, yes. yes this, is, this is the heart of my job. Is this actually- is what I do. Yeah, exactly right. It's so important. And um, Doug, it would be amiss of me uh, to talk about some of the amazing work that you are doing in India. I know that the... Um, uh, uh, you write extensively about that. I received a newsletter from you, I think it was a couple of days ago. Uh, what are some of the projects that you're involved in and why uh, why are you so passionate about those? Um, yeah, well, thanks for asking. It's um, certainly become a, uh, an important part of my life. Um, so I, I work with, well, I'm part of a, a, a big team now um, up in northern India where I travelled there about 10 years ago with my family and met an amazing couple who right. social workers and set up two little schools um, in slum areas. Uh, both had about 10, 15 kids. So, so now through that chance encounter and seeing a need and I suppose also being real, realising that my, my role uh, in Sydney, Australia, in an independent private school is a very privileged role and, I, you know, there's a lot of privilege and resource and, and then seeing this, these people who have nothing who actually need people to stand alongside them and fight for them and advocate wow. for their needs, that really was confronting and changed, wow. rocked my world. So, so over the course of these 10 years we've just through the support of friends financially and a lot of hard work and having some brilliant people who are now part of our team in India. Uh, we, we have about, I think it's about 470 kids who attend nine different school centres. Wow. Um, and so that's pretty big job. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I'm in awe of how you, um, how you manage uh, all of the things that you do. Um, but it seems like it's something that you are so incredibly passionate about. Do you think they both sort of serve each other? Um, do you see similarities between the projects? Do they, um, what lessons have you learned from that? Yeah, you've, you're asking very good questions, very uh, perceptive there, because they do completely. I think both, look, both are similar in that it's all about education and community community and that's where the power is as far as I'm concerned learning and education really sets any child up for life so I look at the kids in my school uh, here in Sydney Uh, you know that is such a a privilege and responsibility that I have to you know to be part of a school team that sets them up for life and to see them to flourish Uh, then equally I look at these other kids in India who have absolutely nothing. And I know the importance and power of education and how that can transform their world. But, you know, through our work, what we were doing was work and still do, we have to do a lot of work with their parents because these kids generally wouldn't go to school if it wasn't for our little centres. They'd actually be working for mum and dad on the streets or begging or doing even more, you know, vulnerable risky things and for parents we have to change their mindsets about the empower the importance of education and and I suppose I see their gratitude and I see their happiness and their contentment with what they the little that they have Mm. and that's 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 a gift for me because it's you know people often say oh you just got to keep the perspective well I, I actually firsthand get to see the perspective a lot yeah. And I also realise that these people and the kids and the teachers who teach them, they teach me so much. And I realise that the world that I live in here in, you know, upper class Sydney is lacking a lot as much as we're a place of privilege. So wow. they both teach me. And as I said before, like my, I think I said this, I was thinking it, uh, my, my job as principal 
has taught me so much that I can apply to the, the context of India because it really isn't a, a case of just rocking up and, and just having a lesson or setting up a school. There's compliance, there's policy, there's government, uh, bureaucracy, and so I'm thankful for the skills I've learned to be able to apply that to the context of India to make, you know, these little schools or centres work. So, yeah, it's very Amazing. much a two-way. Yeah. Amazing, and, and, and thank you um, for all of the work that you are doing um, because um, it's really inspiring to see. It's inspiring to see that, that you can be um, so consumed by your work um, as a principal, but also so committed to things outside of that sphere. I think it's really wonderful. And um, I know that those students wouldn't have the opportunities that they do if it wasn't for somebody like you taking the time to, um, uh, to, uh, to invest into them. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. And do, I think we all just got to do what we can do and, and use the gifts that we've been given and yeah. the resources that we have and yeah. mantra, what can we do to make this world a better place and absolutely and given an opportunity so yeah well I'm, I'm a better person because of it myself so amazing well thank you so much Doug for um for sharing that a couple more questions I do want to be respectful of your time I'm aware that it's school holidays if that is such a thing with teachers uh, most of us are still working um uh, but uh what currently has your attention in education what are you trying to um, what ideas are you wrestling with or trying to implement or? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, this could be another podcast because it's actually a project of mine at the moment. Um, okay. I'm happy to do a round two if you are. I, I would love to hear about it. Yeah. So uh, just in a nutshell, so my school, Claremont College, is 140 years old next year. Gosh. And it started uh, and its first 70 years of existence has been a, a K to 12 uh full primary, secondary yeah. uh, school, uh, and then it stopped the secondary years. So my job this year is actually to create and hopefully get off the ground a, a secondary, you know, year 7 to 12 uh, campus. Now, that's challenging in Sydney because land and finances, you know, you know, it's not easy just to get our hands on those things. So as part of that, preoccupation at the moment is really just trying to engage with our school community and think about well what is the school that we want to see in 10 years time yeah wow. um, what's what's education going to look like how do we future-proof schools broadly and as we and hopefully uh if and when we have success in getting this campus up and running it's not just about okay what are we going to do in year seven but you know What's, what's it going to look like in five and ten years' time on, and in the future as well so that school will continue to be, you know, uh, something that's important? Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's wonderful. I can't wait to hear uh, more, about, uh, more about that journey. Um, Doug, I'm just uh, curious, what do you want your uh, legacy to be uh, professionally? <laughs> um, is a very philosophical questions for school holidays. I, I, I'm aware of that. We are almost at the end. <laughs> Look, I, I think, I suppose I'd love to, to be like the teachers that we were speaking about at mm -hmm. the beginning of uh, this chat. Yeah. Um, you know, I would love for somebody to say, yeah, that, that guy, Mr Thomas, school for me was fun. Uh, it was safe, but I felt like, you know, I belong there. He really saw something in me that set me up for life and yeah. life and learning flourished. Yeah. The result. Fantastic. I love that. Uh, a simple, uh, straight to the point and uh, I think really, really important. Um, so a final question, Doug, where can we find more out about you and where can we sort of follow your incredible work? Um, yeah, it sounds like I've really got a lot of stuff out there. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've written and published about 26 books. No, not at all. Um, I was going to say, when I was researching you for this, I didn't come across those, so maybe you need yeah, to... Yeah, bad marketing campaign yeah. there. Um, that was a bad attempt at humour, by the way. <laughs> I thought it was funny. That's what you hear when you listen to a podcast. Um, <laughs> look, um, I do have a... a a uh, half heart. Uh, well, in my spare time, I, I 
try to upload some thoughts onto a website, which is dougjthomas.net. Uh, projecthelpindia.co is where I put a lot of bo uh, blogs and, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a bit there that hopefully people find interesting and inspiring. Fantastic. Well, Doug, I'll make sure that in the, the show notes I put all of those links and um, I just wanted to um, uh, personally thank you for all of the amazing work that, that you're doing. You're a, a constant source of inspiration and it's so uh, so lovely and such a privilege to get to talk to you. I, I, hope that you um, I hope that you get to have a bit of a rest in these school holidays. Yeah, I do too. Thanks. Um, it's very kind of you to say all of those things. No, yeah. appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussion. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. I've one favour to ask. If you could please head to the iTunes page of the podcast and rate and review the episode. This would really help to get the interviews and resources to as many people as possible. Also, I've created a private Facebook group so that we can continue the discussion after each episode. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and until next time.